Hi everyone, welcome to the DevNet Zone Theater at Cisco Live Berlin. Next up we have Susie Wee talking to us about how APIs are transforming Cisco solutions and catalyzing an innovation ecosystem. So just a couple quick things before we start. Uh, in the DevNet Zone, we have uh, several activities going on, as you know. Um, you can find them on the web, on the DevNet Zone app, or back at the information desk. Uh, they have an iPad where you can find things like that. Talking about the DevNet Zone app, uh, you can use that to get points, to get uh, prizes that we have. We have hats, scarves, and power blocks. And also we have some surveys there, as you see. If you could please fill it out when the, when the session's done and hand it to our friends in the orange vest or orange uh, jackets back there, that would be great. And finally, uh, if you have not signed up for DevNet, please do. It's free. It's great. There's uh, learning labs, APIs. Just go to developer.cisco.com, and uh, you can sign up for free. All right. Thank you, Susie. Great. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you everybody. So uh, today we'll be talking about, again, about how APIs are transforming Cisco solutions and catalyzing an innovation ecosystem. So, uh, you know, as you can see, we're actually here in the DevNet zone. And, uh, you know, what is the DevNet zone? So DevNet is actually Cisco's new developer program. It's actually been in effect for about two years. Um, so the thing about DevNet is that you know, before Cisco had different efforts in developers, but it wasn't really kind of mainstream, didn't have enough critical mass behind it. And then what happened was, you know, we were actually really trying to evangelize to start out and really form DevNet. And so basically we said, Cisco has a software strategy. Um, Cisco has a software strategy. If you're gonna be serious about having a software strategy, you need to have a developer strategy because really developing software is about creating a larger ecosystem and really getting a set of developers around it, and that's how we started DevNet. So here, what we've done is thought about it in this way. So as we know, there's actually uh, you know, a really large portfolio of products that Cisco has. They actually span the Internet of Things, cloud, networking, data center, collaboration, security, and services. And what happens is these are actually very interesting building blocks for, uh, you know, that are used to build out any infrastructure and really in delivering new applications and experiences as well. But what we wanted to do was actually take those building blocks, make sure that we start to create an API layer on top of it and make that into a platform for innovation where other developers can come in and basically grow and other developers can actually innovate on top of this. So in doing this, DevNet is about looking at the developer first. So DevNet is for treating the developer as the customer, where we're looking at the guy or gal who codes and really making sure there's the right resources for them. It's about creating the right and really vibrant developer ecosystem, where again, we can actually have larger solutions where you know, not only does Cisco innovate, but really the larger ecosystem innovates, and we're about providing market opportunities for developers as well. Now, an interesting principle that we have in DevNet is that, first of all, innovation is catalyzed by a developer ecosystem through programmable platforms and APIs. Um, so it might sound like a lot of words, but once again, when, uh, you know, not only do you allow the developers to code, but what you're really doing is pushing a broader innovation effort, and that's what you're really catalyzing by open up these uh, different APIs. Now, overall, let's take a look at some of the innovation drivers that are happening in networking. So, uh, so some of the uh, innovation drivers are actually shown here. So first of all, there's the space of just networking itself. So right now, networking is undergoing, I would say, one of the biggest transformations in decades where networking is actually now moving towards software. So we have software-defined networking. There's actually also things like network function virtualization. This really uh, greatly changes how networking is done. We know that this transition already happened in compute, where compute moved to virtualization and software control, and that transformation is now happening in the network as well. Now, in addition to network programmability and APIs, there have been other types of innovation drivers, which is the cloudification, okay? The cloudification of applications and services and how those are run. So clearly the cloud is a very important element. Um, the cloudification also involves the network itself in terms of really requiring the connectivity 
between different applications that span multiple data centers, across service provider networks, um, and these things that are all owned by different domains as well. So that's a really interesting uh, innovation driver that's happened as well. The last area is that there's also now the network is evolving and the network is actually impacting applications and experiences. So, you know, not only is the network like providing the connectivity and the plumbing, you know, for the network packets to move, but there's actually capabilities being built into the network that's actually allowing new applications and experiences to be built, and we'll be talking about some of that today. Now, in addition to the technology drivers, there's actually a whole set of, uh, of changes that are going on in the developer experience as well. So there's a developer experience where there's developer tools and platforms that are available. So in this new world of programmability, of cloudification, new apps and experiences, there's a number of platforms, developer platforms and developer tools that are being provided. If you want to work in this new area, I wouldn't start from scratch. I would actually use these set of tools that are becoming available. Another shift that's happening in the developer experience is that not only is developing about developing, it's also about developing and deploying your software. It's about developing, deploying, and operating it. And so this is a big shift. So it uh, you know, takes us all the way through DevOps. Um, and then you know, the last shift in the actual developer experience is that there's actually an innovation ecosystem. And uh, you know, once again, there's a broader ecosystem. The way that innovation gets done has actually been transformed where uh, there's, of course, a lot of innovation happening within companies and you know, in different proprietary areas and different technologies. But in addition, a lot of innovation is happening in a broader open source world as well. And this larger community coming together is, again, another way to uh, advance technology. So let's take a look here at uh, one of these areas. So let's look at some of the new apps and experiences that can be created in the Internet of Things. So as we know, there's, uh, there's, there's a big shift that's going on you know, right in front of us as we have the move towards the Internet of Things. And you know, again, this is a new area that's coming to. And if we look at the Internet of Things, we can look at it as an evolution going from crawling to walking and then to running. When we look at crawling, you know, some of the first IoT apps were about one thing connecting to one app and then giving experiences based on that. If we go over to the walk portion of this, then what we know for walk is that there's actually now many things connected to um, many apps. So there's starting to be some more growth in there. But as we move on, there's going to be a scaling that really takes part. And in the scaling, then what there is is there's actually many things in many apps. But in addition, there's so much data that's generated, and this ends up being many times per second. There's a lot of real-time streaming data that's coming through. And once again, this is what's really needed in this whole new world of experiences. So this is an evolution that's happening. And then we're all together really working on, on making this real. Now, within DevNet, we actually have uh, a number of innovation projects that we actually have in order to help developers do more things, you know, or actually to showcase innovations that uh, other you know, developers have, have put, and then they want to showcase them. So we have something that we created called DevNet Labs, uh, which is a place to show some of the innovations that are built on top of these platforms, or built for developers. And uh, we have one project that we have called DevIoT. And in this project, what we did was we asked ourselves, what is an IoT app? So if I asked you all, what's an IoT app? You know, it's kind of interesting to think about. Right? You know what a mobile app is, but what's an IoT app? And then if I said, go and build one, you know, go and build an IoT app, then you'd have to think about, well, what would you do? So think about how you would build it. Well, if someone said to me, build an IoT app, what I would do is I would you know, kind of look on the internet. I would say, OK, let's get a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. Let's grab that. Let's grab a few sensors. Um, you know, let's try to make something happen. Let's get it. I wave my hand over this thing, and I make an LED light up. And I'll say, hey, that's an IoT app. <laughs> Well, of course, that's the first thing that someone would do, and that's actually a good example. And really, anybody can do this very easily these days. 
but that's only the beginning, right? So when we really talk about the Internet of Things, we can actually look at, let's just take this uh, conference facility. Imagine that the infrastructure of this whole conference facility is Internet and IoT enabled. If it's IoT enabled, then there's actually sensors in different areas. It's detecting where people are going, it's detecting the environmental conditions, and then go ahead and analyzing that data, taking actions to really make interesting outcomes happen. So that's much more complicated than just going through and you know, writing your little IoT app. Another question that we ask ourselves is, who's going to use that IoT app? And who's going to program it? Well, if we take this example again of the conference facility, then it actually might not be the software developer who's you know, kind of in his corner writing these apps, but it actually might be used during operation, right? And actually the facilities folks or the conference workers or even yourselves as users might be the ones that are programming that infrastructure. So what we've done is we actually have, uh, have a, a project called DevIoT, and what we've done is created a developer environment that makes it simple to create this type of IoT app. And let me show you a video of this. At Cisco, we're passionate about creating innovations that solve hard problems, especially when it comes to developers. The Internet of Things is an evolving technology with a complicated landscape. It's difficult to connect all your things, get your data analyzed in real time, and deploy your solutions into real operational environments. DevIoT is a Cisco DevNet innovation project that lets you build the next generation of IoT experiences. This developer tool lets you design your solution, generate code, and deploy them to your devices quickly. We want to make IoT real for you. Want to see how this all works? Let's walk through a quick manufacturing scenario. Let's start with the Thing Maker. From my library of connected things, I'm going to drag and drop my machines onto the canvas and connect to a Cisco networking device. This lets me collect and consolidate data. I'll also connect to a visualization widget so I can see it. Now I can instantly view my machine data, like uptime, downtime, and where my machine arm is located. If you make the things used in IoT systems, this will help fix issues fast and improve your supply chain because you'll know what's working and what's not. What if you're in sales and you need to customize a demo? First, I'm going to drag and drop my device components onto my canvas. I'll also connect to a Cisco networking device in my IoT cloud so I can see the data and generate a dashboard view. Now I'll set up rules and policies, letting my app send notifications to the maintenance team and generate performance dashboards automatically. In addition, I want operators to get messages firsthand, so I'll connect to Cisco collaboration technologies like Spark and Tropo. Imagine doing a sales pitch and selling to your prospective customers with a physical solution demo. It's easy to use, intuitive to create, and more powerful to show. Let's imagine you're a facilities operator and you want to see the operations dashboard in real time. Now that I have my solution in logic view, let's click on map view. Here, I see the actual floor plan of my facility. As an operator, I'm interested in viewing one floor and seeing my machine sensor data laid out on the floor plan. Ultimately, this helps streamline my building operations, optimizing my dollars and energy in the long run. In all these scenarios, we're dealing with a real-life customer situation where easy, quick, and intuitive IoT solutions are necessary. With Cisco Dev IoT, we help simplify the complexity by streamlining development and managing deployment, making things easier. As we transform into a more connected world, Cisco helps you accelerate your transition into a viable digital business. Okay, so what you see there is that, you know, again, an IoT app is actually much richer than, you know, the little uh, Raspberry Pi or Arduino example. And uh, there's a few things. If we go back to the question, what is an IoT app? Well, we can say a few things about it. It spans things, right? The physical things that, that people are using. It includes data and analytics. 
and it allows you to take actions as well. It actually involves an ecosystem. So again, in this example, or the manufacturing example, somebody makes the machines, somebody makes some of the solutions, and it might be a different uh, company that's actually operating this. So there's a whole ecosystem that comes together. The solution can you know, not only you know, solve operational issues and provide, but it can actually grow up and actually provide business value as well. So really solving business goals as well. And then it also requires the full IT stack. There's a lot of networking, compute, storage, and cloud that's all involved in this. And another thing is that when we looked at who's programming it and who's using it, it can actually be programmed during use. So programmed in use by, for example, the operational technology folks. So this is really fundamentally different about IoT apps, and we're hoping that this innovation tool will actually make this uh, come too. Now let's take a look at other ways that the network is actually helping to provide new apps and experiences. So an interesting part is now in mobility and uh, location. So we have a product called CMX, the Connected Mobile Experience. And what this is, is Cisco's Wi-Fi access points. And, uh, and what happens is these Wi-Fi access points now give you location information. Now if you think about how Wi-Fi is done, you know, you're here at the convention, and while you're at the convention, you know, you actually are joined in on the conference uh, wireless network. And as you move around between different buildings or even move across the floor, then you actually get handed off between different access points. Cisco actually has something called the Mobility Services Engine, which actually helps you to connect all of those access points. And it's also telling you, you know, when you hand off, how can you stay connected? It's also collecting the location information that you have, uh, that the mobile folks have. So for instance, when I come in with my device, my device is always looking for a wireless network. So even if I haven't logged into it, then basically it still knows I'm here because it's saying, would you like to connect? Would you like to connect? So what happens is uh, you know, the, uh, there's a knowledge about the location and some mobility information about that device. So with that, CMX has maps APIs to actually get maps of the place, to get real-time location information of the things that are moving around. You can actually get location history. And then also, there's actually a notification API that actually shows movements, you know, when has something moved, or the presence, did something become present? So this is actually just really interesting building blocks in which bigger things can be done. So we have another DevNet Labs innovation project that we call Glance. And what we asked ourselves is, how can we gain more insights, take more actions, and gain business value by using location? And what you see here is a picture. You know, it's one thing for a wireless access point to, again, provide connectivity. But what if it actually, and it's another thing for it to provide location, but what if you could actually figure out when somebody's moving around and they spent you know, a few hours in this area, moved around, spent an hour here, and what path they took. All of a sudden, you start to get very rich information that could be very valuable, for example, to a retailer who's trying to understand what's going on. So here, what we have is, some, uh, is an innovation in which we're actually looking at and using that information and now doing things like navigating indoors. So if I take a look here now, what we can actually do is, again, load maps into it, you know, dive in to take a look at what's going on, you know, take a look and find some information about, for example, the DevNet zone. I get some more information, and then zoom in. And here we are in the theater right here. So now imagine that we can actually put heat maps over this that show where things are busy, you know, where the hot spots are, and then we can actually understand the paths that people are taking. And then you can actually provide services like indoor navigation to help people get from one place to another and, find, uh, and, and decide where they're going. In addition, we've actually furthered this and added kind of context. So an interesting problem that happens is that you know, when you're at a conference, you want to find somebody. You want to find the DevNet expert. You want to find the expert on location. You want to find the expert on the Internet of Things can actually have people register in and create a service like this where you can then go and see where the experts are, do a query, and actually find the right expert. So again, it provides a very interesting way to now just build up from location itself 
and provide some compelling services that are really important for people. So now let's take a look at some new apps and experiences in collaboration. So I think that there was uh, there's a talk by uh, Jens Meggers earlier to talk about some of the new collaboration technologies that we have. And there's actually some uh, Cisco cloud collaboration platforms, uh, and there's two of them. One is called Cisco Spark, and then the other is called Cisco Tropo. And what happens is this collaboration is really, you know, can be viewed as an app itself, but it can also be viewed as a capability that's being built in on which other apps and services can be made. So just to dive into Spark a little bit, it includes you know, a very rich way of creating groups, for groups creating rooms, and then in real time, sending messages back and forth between, these different, uh, between the people in these different rooms. Uh, in addition, it integrates with voice and video and things there. But if we take a look at some of the APIs to do this, they're just some simple APIs which you can specify people and add people to groups and take them away. You can specify rooms and put people into different rooms. And then you can send messages into different rooms. So these are the basic building blocks. And let me just give you an example of a way that we've actually used it for our own internal operations. So uh, you know, we have an always on service called the Sandbox. So when developers want to write apps, they can actually use our Sandbox to have a running version of a contact center, a running version of a live network with uh, an SDN solution in there. And they can write apps to it by actually logging into this sandbox environment. Well, our team has to constantly monitor uh, that to see if there's ever any issues or downtime. And if there's a downtime, then we have to actually get in there and solve that as quickly as we can. So what we've actually done is created uh, a system by using these APIs where we're constantly monitoring our services. And we're using different services for that. And then when an issue happens, we just send a Spark message to the folks in the room, uh, to the folks who can be responsible to fix it, and that allows them to get in on the call. In the past, that might have been automated and done through email, but when people are working, you know, or you know, supposed to be monitoring over the weekends or at night, this is actually a messaging service is really a more is a better way to actually get that kind of real-time notification done. We also have a service called Tropo. And Tropo is, uh, is a voice and messaging service, a uh, cloud service that's being offered. And with Tropo, you can actually do things like make calls and send messages, you know, do conferencing. You can send uh, text messages. You can do things like record a message and say, you know, you know, hello, press or say one in order to go to the next operation. So there's actually a lot of very interesting capabilities that you can do for voice and messaging using the Tropo cloud service. Um, it's actually much richer than what I said. It has uh, things like services like number provisioning, voice calling, text messaging, advanced call control, and it has rich media controls using the Tropo cloud. Now, something that uh, we actually uh, want to announce here is that for this service, it was originally operated in the US, um, but can be used. And what is just recently being done is that we actually are having a Tropo.eu instance that we're developing to offer the same service with, uh, with some of our servers actually located in the EU to actually uh, really service and grow this capability uh, to, to, to the European Union. So uh, now I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about network programmability. So we were talking about the network earlier and the move in networks to programmability and APIs. So let's take a look at this a little bit closer. So as we know in the infrastructure, it's actually you know, fairly complex. There's a lot of storage, networking, and compute resources that are being used to run different uh, uh, jobs. And these can be done within different data centers. They can actually be run across enterprise networks. They can be also, of course, traveling across service providers as well. As we enter this world of network programmability, there's actually a few levels of programmability that are provided. So one is programmability in the devices themselves. So as you have, again, the complexity of a lot of devices that are operated you know, across the network, compute resources, storage devices as well, then it's actually important as they become programmable 
what's happening. And what you can actually see here is that uh, Cisco is actually pushing forward and providing APIs into these different devices, into our storage networking products, into our storage products, our compute resources, and our uh, switching uh, networking products as well. So there's a lot of uh, device level uh, programmability that's being provided. Now in addition, as we move to software defined networking, then what's happening is not only do we have the devices that are becoming programmable, but there's now a controller layer where controllers are actually bringing together that type of information across the network. And what happens is the old way that you would actually run and manage this network is very manual. Be talking to each of the devices, trying to do configurations. And when you want to actually operate some type of service or change some service setting across it, it's a very manual and tedious operation. But what the controllers do is help bring that information together, allow you to do some of the automation across those devices, and actually specify kind of policies that can be deployed across the service. On top of the controllers themselves, we have some REST APIs that let you do things like automation and orchestration, that let you run applications like collaboration and security across this as well. So let's take a look at a little example. So here we have an example of network automation with security. And let's see how we can actually put these together when we have some programmability involved. A really important problem that people have to solve is detecting threats in the network. So when you determine, uh, uh, we actually have a product called SourceFire, which is actually very good at threat detection and remediation. So if there's some bad traffic going on in your network, then SourceFire will help detect that threat. As the threat is detected, it sends it up to a SourceFire defense center. Now, once that uh, threat is detected, then some remediation needs to happen. So what it does then is through its APIs, sends uh, some action over to APIC EM and tells it there's some bad traffic. It then needs to update the devices, for example, the ACLs and the access control, to try to block that bad traffic across the entire network. So this is actually an interesting way of bringing together security and network automation together to have a better solution. So the security is actually done by itself uh, using SourceFire, which is specialized in that. But then you wouldn't ask it to then go and deploy it across the network. That's where APIC EN comes in and actually does the automation to actually uh, to do this. So um, again, it shows an example. I believe that Jeff Reed uh, had talked a lot about the newest advancements in APIC EM in his keynote. And uh, this just gives a flavor of some of the power that's behind that. OK, so now also in this area of network programmability, there's a lot of efforts that we're doing in the area of open source. And that really the broader open source community is really doing to develop this. So you know, in open source, we know uh, that, for example, in the compute world, there's efforts like OpenStack, which is really helping us as we go to a virtualized world of compute resources to bring software control and virtualization in the area of compute. Now, in addition, there's, uh, there's uh, an effort called Open Daylight, which is actually bringing together virtualization and software control of networking. And then there's actually uh, a project called OPNFV, which brings these things together. Um, now, what Cisco has done is Cisco's contributing uh, very heavily to, to OpenStack, specifically within a part called Neutron, which is the networking area of OpenStack. And for the networking portion of OpenStack in Neutron, Cisco's actually the number one contributor to this effort. Um, also one of the top five OpenStack members, uh, that's uh, top six code reviewers as well. So very active in this area. Now in the area of open daylight, Cisco is actually also very active in its contributions, in both in terms of the number of commits, really contributing quite heavily, as well as in the number of lines of code. And in addition, it's actually not you know, only Cisco in these areas. It's Cisco, Red Hat, Brocade, you know, the Linux Foundation. Many groups are actually working together to move these areas forward. Now what's also interesting is something called OPNFV. So you know, we talked about the, the area of development, but then the move to DevOps and development and deployment. So what happens is OPNFV is uh, an open source effort, in which case it brings together OpenStack and Open Daylight. 
Um, and as it's bringing that together to both manage your compute, networking, and storage resources, then there still comes the question of how do we make these things run? And so what OPNFE is actually also adds components for integration, continuous integration and deployment, for doing testing on these systems as they're running as well, and really putting in requirements to make it real. So it's actually really interesting how open source has moved from not only doing source code, but also pushing forward into the DevOps and, uh, space as well. Now, uh, you know, we had a panel earlier on open source, and there was a really good discussion about uh, taking SDN and making it real within, uh, you know, within an enterprise. And there was some talk about, you know, both the benefits and the challenges around doing that. And what happens is there may be companies that want to adopt using as something like an open daylight solution, but sometimes you actually also very much need some of the kind of enterprise care and support and things that are associated with that. So another product that Cisco has is something called the OpenSDN controller. And this is really based on open daylight, so it's continuously building in the newest versions of the source code. And in addition, what it's doing is actually providing uh, some special, uh, some, some additional features that actually really help uh, different customers make this real and be able to deploy it within their own infrastructure. Now, one thing as we talk about this world of SDN and network function virtualization, NFV, we're now talking about doing a lot of networking operations in software. And that's really an interesting thing if you think about it because we know that the network has to work really hard. It's mission critical. There's a lot of really heavy duty operations that the network performs. Now there's been a lot of innovation in, uh, in basically SDN, NFV in the cloud as we've been discussing. And a lot of this is in the control plane services that are associated with networking. But we know that to really make this real and to make it scale, we not only need some control plane services, but what we have to look at is the actual data plane itself as well. And the question is, when it really comes down to moving the data, are we gonna be able to move it fast enough in the software world uh, you know, and really be able to do this in a way that scales. So there's actually a new effort that was actually just announced last week, and David Ward talked about it in his uh, innovation talk this week, uh, which is around creating an open source effort called FDIO that's working on really creating a platform for data plane services. So this is a Linux Foundation effort, again, brand new created effort, which is really trying to create a platform for data plane services that are one, really based on high performance, um, also is very modular and extensible, so it can actually do different types of networking operations uh, in software, and then is also open source and interoperable. And so in this brand new effort that's actually been created just recently, um, what we've actually done is, uh, is, uh, is actually open source this work uh, within the Linux Foundation. To take a deeper look, what we see here is actually the stack of, uh, you know, of a system. And the place that um, FDIO works is actually down in the data plane services. And what it does is accelerate the packet processing of uh, the network packets in the network I.O. And this is actually still done in user space. Um, so it can actually still be done you know, in software. But what it's doing is, uh, again, accelerated the data plane itself. Now there's uh, the heart, of the technology that's actually in the heart of FDIO is something that's uh, developed uh, in Cisco that's called vector packet processing. And what happens is, as you actually think about you know, operating network functions in software, then you actually take a network that comes in, a packet, and process it. Take a packet, process it. Take a packet and process it. But what FDIO is doing is looking at vector packet uh, processing, where it's actually bringing as many packets together as possible, and then carrying it through its operations. And by doing this, we can actually get you know, huge improvements in the actual scalability that happens when you're using these uh, software, uh, software functions. You know, and, uh, and when you're actually doing this, they actually continue to scale in a very big way. Now, FDIO works within the larger uh, solution, uh, open, open source solutions in this way. So there's OpenStack with Neutron, which has a plugin into ODL, which is in the control plane. And then FDIO is down in the data plane to really provide those operations. 
And again, they can be used on bare metal, they can be used in a virtualized environment, they can be used in a container-based environment as well. So it's a very exciting new activity. To show you another place that we're actually working in uh, open source, and this is where we're actually moving forward uh, an innovation project that we call Next. And what, uh, what we've hit here is the problem of how do you visualize what's happened in a network, and how do you visualize and view network topologies? So this is an HTML JavaScript framework for actually developing and showing topologies. And this is actually used in a number of ways, and it can be do things to show nodes and to show uh, you know, paths and show traffic that's actually moving across these uh, different areas. It actually lets you zoom in and zoom out and really open and close uh, different network nodes so that you can actually view your network at different scales. <coughs> Now, we actually have provided this as a tool, and we've actually uh, released it in this certain way. So basically, first, we actually developed it internally. And we made it a tool for internal use in some of our different products and uh, research efforts really focused on using uh, the Next UI toolkit. Then what happened is we made it available as an SDK for DevNet members at one of our first DevNet uh, uh, developer conferences in June 2015. So then we actually progressed it further, and we actually released Next as open source within the Open Daylight efforts. And that was in August 2015. And right now, Next is actually becoming part of an official ODL release uh, this month. So this actually shows how we actually started with something as an internal innovation, and then really worked it across, and now pulls it um, through open source. So very exciting effort. Now, what I want to show you is actually the evolution of this. And what question that we've been asking ourselves is, how do you visualize data effectively and in a user-friendly way? And what we've extended this tool, and right now it's still internal, is to look at Next 2.0. So again, with 1.0, it addressed networking. And what it does next is now grow to actually show IoT and indoor navigation, and then also growing to address the problem of big data visualization as well. Um, and again, there's a number of uh, additional modules that were built into uh, what uh, Next 1.0 did. And let me actually show you just a short video that shows some of what it's used for. So earlier I showed you the Glance uh, innovation that we were working on. And actually, all of this uh, view is actually based using Next 2.0. So it's actually built using that library. Can actually do different things like uh, you know, create different modules and be able to drag and drop and actually compose these things in different ways. So we talked about Dev IoT, and you saw that interface. That was also built using Next. In addition, as we move between these areas, you see the indoor navigation that's done. And this was also built using Next 2.0. So there's actually a lot of capabilities that are being built in. And currently, we're working on it internally, but we'll work uh, along a similar timeline to make that available as well. OK, so now I want to move to the area of cloud. And so looking at the area, as we said, there's cloudification is a big uh, innovation driver that's going on. And then also the move to not only for developers have developed, but to develop, deploy, and operate. So as Barry had mentioned in his talk, and, uh, and also as Nick Earl had mentioned in his innovation talk, there's a real shift that's going on in the industry as we go from client server computing to going to cl cloud and to thin mobile clients and virtualization. And now the move is shifting towards containers and microservices to allow a more flexible deployment of these kind of apps as microservices. And this actually requires or creates a change in how applications are developed, as well as in the infrastructure below it. But it provides much more kind of flexibility and agility and performance in this infrastructure. Now, as you're developing in this new world, then there's many tools that are available for processing big data, for working in this cloud environment, and for developing in it. And there's actually uh, you know, really a whole set of tools that range from stream processing to analyzing data to you know, really collecting it. And these are all different areas that are being developed you know, in open source in ways that different people can use. Now, if you're a developer and you haven't been working actively in this space, all these tools are ready for you. And so what you need to do is really, you know, and you wanted to build now an IoT or a big data application, would you start from scratch? 
it's actually really good to utilize these different tools. And so the tools are good, but it still takes a lot of work to bring them together. Now what we have is we actually have uh, uh, an open source innovation that's called Mantle.io. Uh, Mantle and Mantle, and the, Nick Earl had just talked about this in some of our cloud efforts. And what this is, is actually helping you to build a container-based infrastructure that can run microservices. And it's using many of the tools that are shown up here on the right side. You know, but again, if you wanted to take all those together and turn them into uh, you know, a good container-based infrastructure, there's a lot of work to make them work together. So it's actually an open source effort that actually brings together these things to do provisioning of VMs, cluster management and scheduling, adds infrastructure services and support apps of things that you would need to run this infrastructure. So within Mantle, containers are first class citizens. It actually allows us to now seamlessly integrate resources, not only within a data center, but across data centers, you know, enterprise data centers and SPs. The other thing is when you're actually kind of unifying these things, sometimes the application developer doesn't want to deal with how you put those resources together, but it actually allows the network to unify those platforms using a lot of, uh, uh, using different networking technologies that have been you know, very well established and developed. And then what the developer has to do is define the policy in their application, but then let the network itself enforce it across the stack. And so this um, Mantle is a, is a new open source effort that we've put together. You can go to mantle.io and actually uh, really get a stack that will get you going in a container-friendly way. Now, what's interesting is that there's actually different open source efforts that have really been made to be able to flexibly do virtualization and network control and resource management across a single data center. But some of the capabilities of Mantle are basically allowing us to do the same type of resource optimization and management across multiple data centers using some of the underlying networking technology. So uh, this is actually a very interesting effort uh, that we have, and I encourage you to take a look at Mantle.io. And Ken Owens is the CTO who's actually been developing this, and it's a very interesting, very interesting effort. Now let's go talk about, you know, it's great that this exists, but what does it mean for the developer experience? So it's kind of interesting to back, think back to how development was done. And there was a time when writing code was about a developer tool and an IDE, and then source code. So you could use something like Eclipse, have a source code repository, and kind of that was development. Do you guys remember those good old days? But then it's actually changed and evolved. So now it's actually then changed to involve not only developer tools and source code, but also continuous integration and continuous deployment. In addition, it's actually gone beyond that. So it's beyond, beyond the build and develop part to the deploy part, but now also to involve application orchestration, service assurance, and issue management. So now what you're doing is going from build to deploy to operate. And so this is actually now you know, a, nut, a much bigger development chain that you need to work on in this new cloud world. And what happens is there's a number of tools that are being available to really help in all of these different areas. And once again, the tools are very helpful, but now when it comes to a developer to use them, there might be still a lot of work to put these together. Now in addition, when developers are working across these different domains, communication becomes very important as well. And there's this, it's important to have collaboration tools that, again, let you know, the coders talk to the operators and things there. Now, once again, there's a lot of power in these tools, but we want to make it easy for developers. And what, uh, what uh, Cisco has done is created a project called Cisco Project Shift. And what it does is create a developer environment for developers who want to write apps on this type of uh, container-based infrastructure. So you can say that Shipt is actually the developer uh, experience. It's the developer IDE for writing these cloud-based apps. And so what happens is it actually allows you to do things uh, in you know, both writing the code, doing the continuous integration and deployment, as well as the operations. And it looks complicated, but the key is that there's a developer experience that allows you to do this very easily. You actually walk through a wizard, specify you know, the types of environments that you want to run, the place that you want to deploy it, and you can actually go from your code to get your uh, code into production within five minutes. 
And so this is actually on, uh, on ciscoship.io, and you can actually look at, get it from the DevNet page as well, and really learn about how to really take out the complexity, and all of these underlying tools uh, are being used in here, and Mantle is actually underlying it as well. So you can actually get, quickly get going and work in this way. So, um, so that actually shows you like quite a few different areas that we've actually worked through. And what we can see is that the landscape has changed quite a bit. And we know that with DevNet, what we're really trying to do is really enable the developers. And so let's take a look at the mission of DevNet. So when we, our, real, our vision is to really be able to help developers build solutions and grow their careers. Because as we said, it's really all about the developer ecosystem and it's about the developers themselves. Now, when we first started DevNet, we thought that we're building a developer program. It's all about coding. And of course, that's important. We want to provide tools and let people code and let the ecosystem develop. And then when we had our first developer conference, we actually created a lot of learning materials so people could learn the newest technologies, learn the you know, latest uh, coding, coding technologies as well as uh, you know, networking technologies and collaboration technologies as well. But it turns out that a huge value proposition of DevNet that our developers were interested in was actually in the learning. So, you know, really, uh, DevNet is working across all of these different areas. And then developers also need ideas on the different areas that you can work. And I hope that today I showed you some of the Inspire, some of the different innovations that kind of give you a feeling for what can be done when you have different platforms that have APIs exposed as building blocks that are now available to you. So we have DevNet Labs for that. In addition, in DevNet, there's the learning portion. And it turns out that a big part of what was interesting to developers is teaching them to code. So we have a set of coding classes called Coding 101 and 102 up to Coding 201 and 301. And these are helping people to get familiar with REST, to get um, familiar with JSON, to use Python, and put all of these things together. So this is a full set of coding classes. And what's interesting, if you look at a network operator, a network operator who wants to learn about SDN so that they can make it real within their environment, well, the network operator has been awesome at networking. And it's an awesome technologist running mission-critical networks, you know, just really an amazing skill set there. But they probably haven't coded as their day job for about 10 or 20 years. So how do you take that technical person and let them learn about it? Well, they can actually do it through these coding classes and learning labs. And they not only learn about how to code by going off and say, learn to code and write a web page, but they learn about how to code by making calls to a running version of an SDN network with routers and APIC-UM, and then making REST calls to get the information about the devices in the network or set a policy within the network. So it's a very interesting way for people to learn. In addition, there's a set of online learning labs which are helping people, again, take these coding classes and to learn about different types of APIs. And what this is doing is helping people springboard from where they are to, once again, getting to a new domain. So it could be a network operator getting to the area of being able to work in software-defined networking and automation and orchestration. It might be taking a developer and then springboarding them in collaboration and springboarding them to be able to use cloud collaboration as well. So that's another feature. In terms of coding, there's more and more technologies that we're bringing in and trying to make those available to developers. And just recently, we've actually brought on 15 new Cisco technologies into DevNet to make it accessible for the broader, our broader developer ecosystem. You know, in addition, I told you about the Sandbox, which is real life systems that are running and allow developers to go and develop on them. And these are the new ones that we've deployed. So overall, the evolution of DevNet has been you know, quite interesting. We didn't know what the interest would be, but what we're finding out is developers are hungry. Developers want to innovate. Developers want to really create in this ecosystem. Our DevNet membership started with about 50,000 people a couple of years ago, and it's actually already grown in these two years to 370,000 developers. Uh, we have DevNet zones within Cisco Lives, which are developer conferences within the larger Cisco Live conference. And we've had that in every theater. You know, we've created a developer portal at developer.cisco.com, which brings in 230,000 average page views per month. So people are hungry. Uh, we've onboarded new product sets. We have new learning labs. And we're having hackathons all the time for folks. 
And then a new thing that we're going to be doing is really looking at communities of interest to help people develop. And we're actually launching a DevNet women in tech community as well as a DevNet kids community to help there as well. So uh, you can actually find more and join DevNet at developer.cisco.com and it's free. Uh, so please do go there and join. So just in summary, I know that we've covered a lot of topics here. And we covered a lot of topics in these different areas, but maybe this can mean more. So first of all, in the area, again, of network innovation drivers, we talked about the shift in software, in networking, to go from networking to have software control and network function virtualization. So we talked about the move to network programmability. We showed that example there. And we showed this also in terms of APIC-EM and the device level programmability and the controller level programmability that we're providing, as well as the open source efforts in this area. We talked about cloudification and the move to new developer, uh, to, to new uh, environments that involve the cloud. And as we're looking at this area, we actually have tools that are really focused on containers and microservices to provide more agility in this uh, cloudified world, but then providing tools that actually help people develop in these areas. We have uh, new apps and experiences that are, uh, that are now enabled by the network whether they're in location, collaboration, and the Internet of Things. So it's very exciting about the capabilities that are being provided by the network in terms of these new apps and experiences. And then we talked about the developer experience and how that has really progressed, starting from the developer tools and platforms. And there's many new ones that have come up in just the last couple of years, but then really making those in a way that's easier to use for you. We talked about how development has changed from just developing to develop, deploy, and operate. And once again, all the tools available there. And I hope that we showed overall that developers and developer platforms are not just about development, but it's about creating a larger innovation ecosystem so that different solutions can come together and provide more value to customers. So this has been uh, really the key, and you know, Cisco is very committed to working towards this innovation ecosystem by, again, exposing APIs and providing an innovation platform that the broader ecosystem then can then come together and innovate in. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Susie, very much. And thank you for attending. And if you could please fill out the survey and hand them, uh, it looks like our orange shirt's not there anymore, so please hand them to me. Thank you very much.